Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this Saturday morning. My name is Wee Lin from Ethos Books. We're delighted to present Decolonizing Our Natural Heritage in conjunction with Singapore Heritage Fest 2022, a panel that explores the ways in which we can decenter our natural history away from the European lens to see our familiar natural uh, icons and landscapes in a different light. You can access our live notes via the link in the Facebook live stream now and ask questions on our Slido page, which we also pinned on the live stream chat. Rashida from SADAF will be our interpreter this morning. Today's discussion will be a one hour conversation with our panel, followed by Q&A from the audience. So do drop your questions in the Slido page for Faris to see. Let me introduce our panel for this morning. First, we have Kairuddin Wahab, an artist whose paintings weave narratives drawn from environmental history, material culture, and post-colonialism in Singapore and Southeast Asia. Working from found images and iconography derived from his geographic and cultural context, Kairuddin creates visual tableaus that allude to our historical, political encounters with the natural world. He was the winner of the 2018 UOB Painting of the Year and the 2014 Winston O. Travel Award. Next, we have Mok Tsuning, or the author of the Orchid Folios. Tsuning is obsessed with random things. Orchids, arabesques, trees. Her work appears in the Rompus, the Straits Times, and the Los Angeles Review of Books, among others. She recently graduated with an MFA from the University of Minnesota and is working on a book about sand. Our third speaker is Nadira Nordin, a research associate at ISEAS Yusuf Ishak Institute. Prior to that, she was an associate curator at the Merle Heritage Center and later an associate librarian at the National Library. Her main interest lies in the literary and cultural productions of the Malay world. Last but not least, I'm glad to introduce our moderator for this session, Faris Joraimi. Faris is a Lee Kong Chien Research Fellow with the National Library. As a writer and researcher specializing in the history of the Malay world, he has authored various essays for print and electronic media. He is also co-editor of Raffles Renounced Towards a Medica History, a volume of essays on Singapore's decolonial history. Faris, please take it away. Um, thanks, Waylin, uh, for the introductions. Um, I guess we have one hour before Q&A, so we can probably just jump right in, I think. Um, I guess I'd like to really start by kind of each of our personal contexts, how did each of you arrive at natural histories as a theme of your work or practice? Because we all come from such diverse, I think, fields of interest and we work with different mediums as well. So yeah, perhaps you could share a little bit about kind of how you came into this um, personally. Uh, whoever can start first. Perhaps Nadira, would you like to start first? Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining us today for a, a rather early morning talk um, and thanks Faris and Waylin for, for the introduction. Um, for me, my interest in this topic, I would say, started out as a rather faith-based one. Um, it was due to, it, it gave me like um, a rather deeper appreciation of God and that becomes stronger through nature because it helps me to affirm my beliefs in our surroundings, our environment, how certain things came to be and so on. Um, so I've written a few uh, papers and articles on Malay medicine, which I know predates Islam, but following the introduction of Islam to this part of the world, Malay healers have incorporated aspects of the religion to their practice. And this syncretism was very appealing to me. And apart from that, I also grew up watching tons of nature documentaries. So looking at how people um, lived um, with the environment and grew along with nature, all of this is very fascinating to me. Um, and yeah, I would 
say that is you know um that sparked my interest in um natural history. Mm, right. Thank you. So, kind of returning to, um, a view of nature that's not so decoupled, I suppose, from sort of you know uh its its cultural context, its spiritual context, um, not so much of an objectified view of nature as such. Um, Kairudin, what about you? Uh, f- I think for me, it, it really started with uh, one of my early works, I think in 2018. Mm. Uh, I did a particular piece that was about uh, Silat, but the Malay martial art form, but I wasn't interested in Silat as uh, a form of self-defense. Uh, more, more like, uh, I was looking at it more as like a microcosm of the Malay culture. Mm. Because uh, for me, it encompasses, you know, like customs, spirituality, uh, mysticism, magic, even traditional healing. So it's not it's not strange to see like a Silat Guru is often like a religious leader or someone who's doing like traditional medicine. So I think what kind of uh, Nadia touched upon, like there's this syncretism that happens. Yes. And uh, I guess I, I found that there's some, you know, kind of roots in animist beliefs mm. and how this has uh, syncretized with the Islamic faith that arrived in the region. So when I was doing this research and then it subsequently led me to look into animism in Southeast Asia. And then, mm. you know, animism is kind of like a reverence for the natural world. So, so eventually I went on, uh, you know, the rabbit hole and got into reading into the tropics and eventually environmental history of Singapore. So it was kind of like a long way to where I am today. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, that's so interesting. And and both of you bring up this very important and major theme, actually, in, in, in studying Southeast Asia, which is really, I mean, syncretism in Malay culture, but also Islam, and how it manifests in, in this part of the world, and, you know, how it interacts with its environment in often very distinctive ways. Um, we may come back to that, uh, but before we dig deeper, uh, Tsuning, what would be your kind of approach? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be talking to you guys and, and hearing, you know, what, what you have to say. Um, for me, I really came to natural history only to read ethics. So I was writing about ethics and I became interested in ethics because I learned about some of the hybridization um, industry. So it's very much like a contemporary the more research I did on ethics, the more I found out about its colonial history and um, uh, the role that it has played in Singapore and also in the UK, especially um, things like pocket mania and all of that. So for me, I really arrived at natural history through doing research on ethics and doing research on how um, the empire has kind of co-opted the ethic as this um, exotic object mm-hmm. and for its own power, really. Right, right. And in many ways, how Singapore has also perpetuated that practice, yeah, seeing the orchid as, as, as part of this. I mean, yeah, kind of part of this mania with collecting and creating new hybrids, and which is really a, a, an expression of, of mastery over nature as well. Uh, there's a, an element of power at work that the orchid really kind of symbolizes. Um, I think your mic was a little bit muffled, Zening, just now, so if you could um, adjust it, or perhaps if you could speak closer to the mic, um, it, it may be okay. a bit better. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Um, so so I guess we can start with you first, Zening. Um just, just building on 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 those points, um, your work, uh, the orchid folios, uh, kind of deals very heavily with the construction of a national landscape, right? The creation of Singapore as a national uh, landscape, and how much again that owes to imperial science. Um, do you see any decolonial possibilities in uh, practices that have colonial roots, such as collecting and taxonomizing nature, classifying nature? Do you think there's any room for ambiguity? Could you say perhaps that, oh, well, this is a form of appreciation. We don't always have to think of it in terms of exploitation and power. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Uh, first of all, how is this sound? Is it better? Or... Yeah, that's much better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, this is definitely a question that really troubled me while I was writing about orchids. Uh, the last thing I wanted to do was write about orchids in a way that could, you know, kind of play into that narrative of it being exotic and um, just uh, unproblematically so. And, and so I, I did think a lot about this. And, you know, I'm not a natural history expert, so I can't really say what decolonial methods there are in socializing and collecting and all of that. I'm sure that um, Nadia being a curator would have much more to say about that. Um, so I can really only comment on, I think, metaphorically and narratively, how I try to get around this problem of um, the, like colonialism and decolonization. So I think for me, much of um, colonialism in this book played the role of kind of crafting and arranging things, arranging mm -hmm. this for the power of the empire, right? Um, and, and all of that. So for me, metaphorically, it was moving from that uh, narrative of arrangements and kind of cuttings and, and all of that taxonomizing into a narrative more of growth and nurturance. So for example, um, my forest, instead of kind of um, completely rearranging things over and over again, what she ends up doing is she ends up becoming a sort of gardener instead, mm. um, in the sense that she takes a cutting and, you know, she repots it and nurtures it and gives it a new kind of life. Mm. Um, and narratively, my forest is a very ordinary average person. I don't think she necessarily has the language of decolonization in her vocabulary. And so, you know, for her, I think in her very personal terms, decolonization really means kind of taking back the orchid and re like really remembering the orchid as something that she has a relationship with. Mm -hmm. and something that she, that kind of helps facilitate the relationship between herself and her own mother. Mm. So it becomes this very personal object. This very personal, not object, this very personal, this living thing that you have a very personal relationship with. And I think right. that's part of decolonization. It's instead of using plants as an instrument of power, you're kind of bringing it into your own kind of relationships um, and kind of, uh, you know, Coming into a personal relationship with mm -hmm. that. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you. So that this is, it's really, I mean, a kind of a version of decolonization that doesn't have to depend so much on, you know, really loud or bombastic gestures of politics or action, but really kind of taking it back to the realm of the personal. Uh, and in many ways, in the realm of the personal, in our everyday lives, we can also do a lot to resist uh, colonial logics, right? So, uh, and, and in your case, it really was about redefining that relationship with the natural uh, in many ways. So, um, what about um, Kairudin? I'm, I'm drawn particularly to, to your work entitled A Variation on Things Imperfectly Known. Um, it's, it's a painting, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that depicts uh, or rather reminds me of Alfred Wallace and his uh, Malay assistant Ali as they would have appeared out in the field. Um, and, and the work feels to me like a mirror image that actually subverts mm. how Ali is officially remembered, right? He's always remembered yeah. as Wallace's sidekick. Uh, and if you go to the Lee Kong Chia Natural History Museum, there's a statue outside and um, that, that's how they're portrayed as well. You know, Wallace is kind of pointing to the specimen and Ali's kind of there with his rifle. But instead here, we have Ali, the one pointing the way, right? And Wallace is more or less the passive collector. Um, how else can we write the native, with quotation marks, yeah, back into colonial history or the history of modern science uh, generally? Uh, yeah, thanks for, you know, your reading of my work. <laughs> I think it's, I think you kind of hit the, the, the nail on the head because I, because I, I didn't talk to you, you know, about this work, but you kind of just gave it to me. So I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, that's very of course, there are different interpretations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah. But that was, 
close to what I was, you know, kind of thinking about when I did it. And uh, so, I mean, I, I was thinking about, you know, the European naturalists like Wallace or Darwin who arrived in the region and, mm. and oftentimes was, uh, you know, was guided by local figures like what you say, like Ali. So in that sense, it was, uh, you know, in the production of knowledge that they created, I suppose, you know, when it was imported to Europe, wasn't really or didn't give, you know, the the kind of acknowledgement that, you know, Ali would maybe would have. So uh, I was thinking about all these uh, lesser known or hidden narratives, you know, that are waiting to be retold. And then historical figures uh, whose contributions I think are worthy to be re-examined. Mm. So I suppose to your question about how to, you know, write the native back, I think yeah, it's to to kind of reassess uh, the figures that contributed to or uh, help you know to build this uh, body of knowledge. So I think one example is uh, Muhammad Hanif. He was working with Singapore Botanic Gardens, I think through a few directors, and he co-authored uh, one of the books, Malay Village Medicine. Mm. Uh, it was published in 1930 with uh, Isaac Burkhill who was the Singapore Botanic Gardens director in 1912. So he also contributed to another of his book called uh, Dictionary of the Economic Products of the Malay Peninsula. So, I mean, clearly, like, obviously, like, we, we don't really, you know, we're not really aware of uh, him as a figure, but Isaac Burkhill is, 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 I guess, on a different, like, we kind of know him more. Maybe not not on a, a lay person, but in in terms of history and the, the kind of weight that is placed on both of these individuals. Mm. So, I think yeah, it's about kind of reassessing you know the the figures that contributed, and uh, oh, and I think another fun fact is also that uh, he got a few plants that was named in his honor because yeah. he I think he discovered it. So one of it is an orchid. Mm. Uh, the scientific name is Dendrobium hanafi. Yeah. Wow. Right. So, right. It kind of ties yeah. to uh, settings, you know, orchids. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and, and really kind of gets into, I think, the way the history of science is told, right? It's always told mm. through these great men, uh, the, 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 the myth of invention and, and genius. But really how scientific discoveries work was that they relied on the labor of a lot of unnamed people who weren't able to get their name on a species or, or write up the description or whatever. And, most often, it's really through these little fragments, like the you know species named after Hanif or species named after Salim Ali, who's another yeah. you know was an Indian uh, ornithologist. But very few. Um, but it's really, I think, about time we reconstruct these histories. Actually, there's still a lot to be done. Um, I think um, so. I think Nadira, we. Uh, you you work a lot on on I mean yes on Malay healing practices and all that, um, and in wanting to reorient our attention back to that, um, there may be people who think this you know potentially risks othering Malay culture as, as peculiar or bizarre, um, but also you've written you've you've written about how um, colonial scholars themselves right for example like Percy Gerard recognize the scientific merit of Malay medicine. So it's not all, you know, bomos and pawangs and all that, you know, there were some quote-unquote scientific uh, aspects of these. Um, what were some of these arguments um, that, that people like Gerard raised? Yeah. So just to comment on the otherworldly bizarre aspects of, you know, uh, Malay healing practices that people have often talked about, um, there's this um, quote from Diana Rahim who was actually presenting last week that I thought mm. um, kind of embodies this idea that it's not merely a bizarre practice but it's a rather an accepted, it should be accepted as a body of knowledge because it is, you know, it, it is a system that um, involves healers, that involves, um, um, you know, of course, um, nature and stuff like that. So she says, I quote, the knowledge developed and accrued within traditional knowledge systems is not by any means entirely spiritual or mystical or mm. random. Just like any body of knowledge, it is deep, systematic, and has its experts. So I find that, you know, this has to be said that it's not entirely magical or spiritual, but of course, this is something that most people are interested in whenever I'm talking about um, Malay healing and, and Malay medicine. You know, people tend to always want to talk about the hantus and, you know, the mystical. Yeah. Uh, for Gerard, 
um, he did give due credit um, in his works to Malay midwives in particular, such as the operation of uh, reversed uterus. Mm. Um, yeah, so I have quite, quite a bit of quotation, so bear with me. Uh, I would quote, for, I, I'm quoting from him where he said that one is driven to reflect that some of their methods or devices must be at least worthy of study. Okay, it still sounds a bit um, condescending, must be at least worth of study, but you know he's actually still acknowledging it, which is one. And he also mentioned that midwifery is non-meddlesome and therefore fairly good. Mm. Yeah. And plus, he also saw merit in Malay medicinal herbs and plants which can be incorporated into British pharmacopoeia. Um, again, I quote that there are 100 drugs given in place may easily be its equal, if not superior to ours. You know, that we have so many drugs that it could be our equal or even better than the British uh, current um, drugs that they have found. And... Um, and he also mentioned that Malays will be valuable allies to European medicine, but we must, in the first place, gain their confidence. So this is actually very interesting because he is also a believer that a lot of British medical professionals do not make an effort to understand ailments described by Malays. Um, so he feels that they often then do not receive proper diagnosis, that Malays do not receive proper diagnosis because the British were ignorant. And he was ashamed of his ignorance, as he says it in the introduction of his um, book, for failing to understand and grasp the Malay's conceptual understanding of medicine and healing. But I'm not here to, you know, conflate um, Gerard's uh, that or saying that Gerard was super progressive or anything by any means, because of course he still held very questionable and racist views of the community. Uh, for one, um, on Malay pathology, he said that they know nothing. Their pathology depends on the Hantu theory. So that's also... Hantu theory. <laughs> Hantu theory was something that he, he came up with. Or maybe someone else came up with, but he mentioned Hantu, Hantu theory quite a bit when he's talking about Malay pathology. Mm. Um, another figure, another colonial um, officer that I would like to bring up is Gimlet. Gimlet mm. um, did also credit um, local knowledge in his work. For example, he described um, various species of pufferfish along with their Malay names. Um, and he also um, completed it with anecdotes on the poisonings and what are some of the Malay antidotes if you're poisoned by a certain species of puffer fish. So it's a very detailed uh, list of instructions on how to prepare the fish to render. So I find all of these quite interesting that they give credit, but at the same time, it is important for us to note that this does not mean that you know they found everything about Malay medicine um, um, like I would say, worthy of praise in their in their in their in their um, perspective. So they they do, yeah, they do give, give credit sometimes. Yeah. And it, and the, the the overall attitude still seems to be that this is an unsurveyed field of knowledge, and we need to make it familiar to ourselves. We need to translate it into our own system of pathology, uh, and and that it has to be tested because that was the prevailing method. And at the end of the day, there was still a hierarchy between sort of the tested uh, scientific, what they considered scientific and what they, what was, you know, Hantu theory, yeah. etc. Yeah. Um, but thank you for that. Um, it, at the end of the day, I think so a lot of modern medicine, a lot of modern science really owed a lot to indigenous knowledges. Um, and, but, you know, um, it really was about how that had to be translated for what was considered a modern knowledge system uh, according to European standards. Uh, and for that, I'd like to perhaps remark a little bit on what Kairudin said earlier and what you said as well, Nadira, this idea that uh, in that traditional Malay setting, there was no distinction, no hard distinction between, you know, what was rational uh, and, and secular knowledge and what was mystical uh, religious, spiritual knowledge, right? Because the medicine man, the ritual practitioner, the 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 the, the bomo, the pawang, whoever, was also a, a, an environmental expert, a natural expert. So you had silat practitioners, of course, but also people like pawang laut, pawang hutan, etc., who not only uh, knew 
the spiritual aspects of an of of a particular natural space, but really also understood uh, the space ecologically, right? They knew about flora and fauna, etc., and and how to operate within that space. So um, that distinction, I think, uh, between the natural and the spiritual is really one of the big contributions of of this European scientific worldview. Um, and Nadira, in your work, did you come across other uh, sort of local or Malay uh, individuals who, uh, you know, kind of contributed a lot to 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 science to uh, colonial science, but have been forgotten? I mean, uh, uh, Kairudin mentioned Muhammad Hanif. Who who else were there? Yeah. So um, there's always been um, so the collab the productive partnership between Hanif and Berkeley. Um, is always kind of known to a lot of people, especially those studying environmental history. But besides Hanif, there were other, <clears throat> I'm so sorry, <clears throat> there were other figures such as Anti Ahmad Hassan that I would like to highlight. Yeah. He was um, one of the Botanic Garden's pioneer plant collectors, and he was actually described as a walking dictionary on Malay flora particularly. Wow. Wow. Um, he was actually planning to complete a dictionary, which was unfortunately unfinished because unfortunately he died uh, while, while um, coming up with this uh, dictionary. It supposedly contained a taxonomy of Malay flora, including their Latin and Malay names, along with medicinal values. Um, Ahmad Hassan had actually accompanied Ridley on his pioneer trips to uh, Malaysian jungles and persuaded farmers there to cultivate rubber seeds. And I also noticed that a lot of these names I can only find when um, information is written about them in obituaries, or when they've passed on and so on. So that's quite interesting that, you know, when Ridley or Burkill or whoever were going on their expeditions, these people were always classified as plant collectors. You know, he had three plant collectors with him, but they were never named. And then, you know, later on, we find out that, oh, it could have been Ahmad Hassan, it could have been Hanif or whoever. Um, and for Ahmad Hassan, he was not just a plant collector, he was also the chief recorder, the storekeeper, and the, the head librarian. And he was in charge of collecting seeds that would then be dispatched to other botanical institutions overseas. So he was a very well-connected man as well. Um, another name that's also been buried in the archives is Haji Muhammad Noor bin Muhammad Gauss. He was a Singaporean, um, he was a Singapore herbarium assistant, and he was instrumental in a lot of the taxonomic uh, organization between 1920s to 1950s, and he was known to be a master at his work. Um, and I would say that we can really thank him for deconstructing a lot of local knowledge that were put under taxonomical organization that is comprehensible to the colonial authorities back then and for us today. Mm. Um, and there's this um, very interesting um, quote from him that I would like to read. Um, very Please, poetic. Yeah. yeah, very poetic man. Um, everything comes to me naturally, and from experience, my first job was in the garden when I left the sixth standard in an English school, and I grew up like a plant rooted in the rich soil. So that is, you know, how he described himself. And what is also interesting about these men is that a lot of their sons also continued their work, so we can see it as a lot of intergenerational knowledge um, in this uh, particular study of um, plants and uh, of flora and fauna in Singapore. And lastly, there's another man called Nadiman bin Haji Ismail. He was a plant collector at the Botanic Gardens as well. Um, for example, Nadiman was sent to Kota Baru to find monkeys. So to find monkeys, and what were these monkeys known for? They were actually trained by Nadiman to look for um, certain um, plants that were hard, in hard to reach places. So he would train the monkeys, you know, this is how you climb, or this is what I want, so on and so forth. And there were many um, famous monkeys in the botanic gardens at the time. So their names were Te, Jumbo, Mira. So they were kind of icons of the, of the gardens during that time. And Nadiman was the one who trained them. Ooh. And like you said, you know, there were a lot of unnamed people, a lot of um, unnamed local expert knowledge. And this also came from people like Pawangs and also healers who were helping the colonial authorities and even um, the Dayak natives when they traveled to Borneo. So for example, people of the Sakai tribe who um, provided a lot of information to Ridley. And um, you know, we don't know exactly who they were, but we just know they were from this tribe. So these were some very interesting things that came 
uh, in my research and interesting names that popped up that I did not know of before. Um, and a lot of us probably don't know of before. So it'll be, it'll be good for us to learn more about these big people. And maybe they still have their notebooks, you know, kept by their grandsons and so on. So Thanks. I'll be interested. So shout out to any of the grandsons out there. Oh, granddaughter. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. If there are any of our listeners who, who are in any way remotely related to uh, these individual personalities, or if you have a relative who, you know, worked at the botanical gardens, you know, I mean, these are all important, um, you know, historical um, material that will help us to kind of like, you know, um, uh, paint a full, have a fuller picture to understand our, our history of science, really. Um, so this is, again, you know, the, the, the work has barely begun, um, but we, we have had kind of public uh, um, exhibitions uh, talking about how to, you know, tell Singapore's natural history in a different way, uh, one of which being the National Library's research show Human Ex Nature, um, which presented uh, a more kind of self-aware and reflective um, uh, uh, environmental history uh, uh, of Singapore uh, and really kind of tackling the impact of colonialism uh, in my view quite quite head on uh, especially in the earlier parts um, how else do you think we can reform the way Singapore's environmental history is taught in schools or whatever uh, and really talked about right in in public um, whoever can go first uh, Zining, perhaps do you want to go first Nadira can take a break <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that something that is very important in this thing, I, I thought that the human uh, nature exhibition was so interesting. Um, it was, yeah, I, I was just delighted by it. So I do feel like the NLB and the URA, etc., they are very much holding many, many, like more workshops than in the past. So that's like a very, I think, encouraging thought. But I think something else that's very important is also in schools, right? A curriculum that emphasizes not just the facts, but also how environmental history was crafted, right? Like we, we, we might learn about people like Whitley, like Burkill, and, and these were the names that I first stumbled upon mm. when I was um, researching orchids as well. But it was only through very thorough research, right, that I would start to understand that um, like Ahmad Hassan, for example, was a collector for Ridley, and that was such a, and Ridley was such a big person here, and he's kind of lauded as this, like, figure, you know, but um, it would not have po been possible without, you know, without so many people that we don't know. So I think a basic understanding of how environmental history is kind of crafted and who is in the narrative and why they're in the narratives. I think that's very, very important. And I think history kind of should, you know, history classes should very much um, pay more attention to um, the writing of history and, and the power dynamics that are involved in that. And I think it's the same with um, our national flower, Venom is Joachim too. And in fact, so it was hybridized by this local Armenian woman, Agnes Joachim, and uh, it really had kind of acknowledged her as the creator of this hybrid. But for the longest time, all of these um, Singapore Botanic Garden directors were like, no, she couldn't have hybridized it because, you know, she's a woman and like the locals wouldn't have had the resources and the knowledge to do this, um, which is exactly, I think, what both Karudin and Nadira were talking about, right? All of these great men are in the books, but um, so many locals and so many women are kind of sidelined as well. And it was really, I think, only in 2016 or 17 that Agnes Jo Kim finally got officially acknowledged as the creator of Banda Miss Jo Kim. And that's very, very recent, I think. Yeah. And um, I think that presents a very good case study on understanding how history is written. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Kind of attending to the dynamics of power uh, uh, in these histories and, and to not, I guess, adopt always this triumphalist attitude, right? That it's always about 
Singapore overcoming nature. I think you can, um, especially if we're talking about schools and, and we're talking about, about public history, um, this, is, this is a major, major theme in how we talk about our, our past. It's Singapore overcoming nature, whatever, physical limitations, and that's so central to our, our, our identity and our narrative. And I think that really lies at the heart of, you know, the, of, you know revising the way we think of our relationship uh, to, to our environment. Um, yeah, um, Kairudin, what do you think? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> sorry, before I answer, I think I, I want to go back to uh, what Nadira talked about, like knowing yeah. certain figures only from like the obituaries. And I think one person that I, I was working, I mean, I, I did work about was someone called Juraimi Ben Samsuri. He's a botanical illustrator. And I, I only found out because uh, I visited the, I believe it's the botanic, uh, what the, the museum, right? The they museum, have a new yes. Museum at the Gallery Extension. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then I saw the drawings, and then I look at the name. I'm like, oh, like yeah. it's it's uh, you know it's a local guy. So I, I went to dig about him, and then the only yeah. thing I could find was you know his obituary and some uh, contributions he made to a journal. Uh, yeah. So it was quite fascinating to learn about. Uh, you know his his history and and how he contributed to the whole botanical illustration archive at Singapore Botanic Gardens. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, Anthony Madrano is uh, an environmental historian who's been looking at uh, some of these figures. This um, Jeremy Samsuri, who was actually apparently also quite connected with the local Malay painters, the the, hmm. the visual arts paint scene of the fifties yeah. and sixties, apparently. Um, yeah, and, and there were other people like like Yusuf Ishak's father, Ishak bin Ahmad, who was, you know, the first non-European director of uh, the fisheries department in the Strait Settlements and was of huge help in identifying and classifying Malayan fish. Uh, so, you know, there were all these people um, performing that work of local identification for, you know, European scientists. Yep. But please go on, sorry. Yeah, so, uh, no, it's okay. Uh, yeah, so I think back to your question about uh, how to kind of, you know, teach environmental history and I guess uh, one, one way is to, you know, look at your surroundings, your, the gardens, the green spaces we have, the nature reserves and, uh, you know, seeing how the landscape around us has been built up because uh, I think Singapore is very unique in that it's, it's such a you know, the, the nature here is, uh, you know, natural, but at the same time, unnatural mm. because everything is so, uh, you know, structured and all the trees that line the roads. Uh, so, you know, even it's, it's everything is, uh, you know, there was a, a certain, there was an element of design in the way that, you know, our environment has been built up. So I think that's a way to, you know, take it as a, launching pad to think about how these environments came about and how you know ideas about uh, constructing our landscapes are created so i think like for example the the garden city plan that mm. the late lee kuan yu you know he started in the 1960s uh, that was kind of that was also inspired by his i believe travels to europe when mm. he was traveling and he felt like Oh, like the you know the, the environment in maybe one of the European cities he visited was so uh, proper you know like uh, the nature was nicely uh, you know built up and all the tree line roads so that was kind of the spark for him to uh, create that to create the Garden City plan mm -hmm. and this plan eventually you know it got updated I think maybe twenty seventeen somewhere around there or maybe earlier uh, to it's called I think a city in a garden. So mm. it, it went from a garden city to a city in a garden. So I think in, in the wording itself, it kind of uh, makes you think about how this shift from ch looking at the city as a you know, garden city to a city that's in a garden and how yeah. that's reflected in the way that the environment you know, has been built up around us. Mm. So yeah, I guess you, you could see, you, know, you just look around and it, become, it becomes like a way for you to rethink uh, how your landscape around you is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think now the updated tagline is a city in nature or something, right? They're trying oh, really? to kind of really, 
yeah so i mean they're changing these things all the time uh and and it's you know um begs the question of whether i mean which is better right is to frame it as city in nature or city in a garden because ultimately as, as i was listening to a podcast the other day that was discussing this uh t42 i highly recommend it um it, i mean it all nature ultimately has you know human intervention in it right even what we consider the most pristine nature has uh, a degree of manage uh, of human management and, and human contact uh, the the issue really is about on what scale right because we think about indigenous societies having this completely harmonious relationship with an untouched natural world but even that is a colonial myth right because many indigenous societies were actively managing their ecological uh, resources and and that was really kind of part of that symbiotic uh, relationship uh, and in in many ways that was one conception of a managed nature right um, in singapore what we have is a very extreme form of hyper management of nature uh, the, the the garden city um, concept uh, but yeah absolutely uh, thanks very much for that um, Nadira, what do you what what are your thoughts on kind of rethinking public environmental heritage education, etc.? Um, I agree with Tining, uh, in the sense that you know to, to to learn more about the power dynamics that exist in our our environmental history because I think that's very important. And for me, that's also even a work in progress. You know, as I'm doing more research on it, I find new things all the time, and which makes it all very exciting because then there's more to write about. Um, and also, I think besides that, uh, we could also learn more about um, the ecology um, of our, the ecology in the sense that, you know, what does this herb help with, what does this herb help with, and that, and so on, and how it, the use of a certain thing impacts the other flora and fauna around them. So these are some things that we can maybe look into. And I recently read some paper that's very interesting by Cynthia Cho. It's on mm. so basically an ethno-historical account of agriculture and farming in Singapore. So this is, I feel like this very untapped um, topic in terms of studying our environmental history, looking at how there were a lot of personal and family farms that were, that were kind of um, phased out in the 70s and 80s particularly, um, including vegetable and food farms. Um, and how Go Kim Sui, for example, in the 80s mentioned that the agricultural policy should be reworked because it was no longer Singapore's aim to achieve self-sufficiency in primary produce. So he believes that it was better to focus on what the nation would do best, which is to produce goods and services in which it had a competitive edge over others. So this is very interesting to me, you know, like um, it's not really talked about today in terms of um, all, what happened to all of these um, personal family farms, you know, how, where did, where did they go after that? How did their dives turn out after that? So yeah, it's, it could be something that we could be, someone could take this up to, <laughs> to reform our writing of history. Yeah, absolutely. And we are sort of kind of seeing um, more public interest, I suppose, in, in you know, things like urban farming and, and 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 things like that so there is a kind of revived interest in that because for the past couple decades it was always about this right the rural space in singapore had to be eliminated and it was always kind of seen as a as as a something that disturbed singapore's own kind of image as, as an urban uh economy that was like you said producing goods and services for the rest of the world and not producing anything for itself so um, in that respect, I think there is more kind of, of a public uh, shift uh, in how, you know, this sort of self-sufficiency works. And, and indeed, uh, a lot of these memories, these uh, uh, specialized skills that, that people used to have if they grew up on, 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 on the farms in, in Singapore that are now lost, I mean, these are fields of knowledge that, that can be tapped uh, as well. Um, so yes, yes. Um, yes. Oh, Sydney, sorry. I to... just yeah. I just wanted to add on to that. I got very excited because um, I actually live in Badok South. Yeah. I actually live where you know uh, near the Limau Estate. So it's, oh, it's where okay. all the old fruit farms were, and and it's it's very interesting. It's it's definitely a question that I've been thinking about and like 
just walking around this area, you know, imagining mm. where the hills used to be before they were excavated and cut Absolutely. down and the histories Absolutely. around. And what I've been noticing is like, I think in the, in starting last year, there started to be these like Godot heritage trails, mm, mm, things mm. all pinned around and, and all of these, um, I feel like there are little clues everywhere. You know, you have the trails, but then you have like the road names and like, yeah. why is this road called like Limau Kasturi, for example, you know? And, Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's just, I think also just getting to know our area, our own neighborhoods in a way that's not Absolutely. just like HDB blocks and, Absolutely. you know, um, Gopitiams, all of that. Uh, but kind of wondering how, like yes. Karudin has said, the landscape has been written yes. upon and how it has changed, you know, I think I think that's very interesting and very yeah. experiential as well. Yeah. And and the and the and the resources are out there, right? You can go to the NUS um, historical maps uh, database online and you can kind of see zoom in uh, into specific areas of Singapore that go all the way back to like the eighteen hundreds and see I did this with my street. Right, I live somewhere in Loyang, and like you know, you find all these hills that used to have names. Okay, those hills had names, uh, and they were probably very pretty ancient. And sometime in the eighties and nineties, they just disappeared. Right, so like what Kairudin was saying as well, kind of like learning more about your landscape. It doesn't have to just be about Singapore on a grand scale. It could start with your own little neighborhood or your own street, which had its own environmental past as well. Right, and and often very rich. Uh, environmental history how did your own local landscape change what were the you know were there old rivers that would be channeled were there old hills i mean remembering these physical landscapes because again at the end of the day the story of singapore's development is a very physical one and a very violent one it's really how you know the reclamation the leveling of the hills the kill the, the filling in of swamps i mean so you know that's also one way to, to 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 rethink our natural history um which brings me to the next question um you know a lot of folkways whether it's thinking about medicine whether it's thinking about um about food right gardening um a lot of these endured in the past because communities still had access to uh the physical environments that sustained them right i mean even during the british period actually quite a lot of the areas in i mean there were plantations all over the island but there were still pockets of you know uh communities that had access to their ecological terrain these weren't all wiped out the way they are today um but you know most people in singapore in the present right are dislocated from many of these contexts um how do you think we can reconnect to these older modes of engaging uh, with nature, with the environment, uh, and also, of course, the cultural knowledge uh, that comes with them. Yeah. Anyone want to go first? You can you can take your time to think. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I guess I can go first. I, yeah. I guess I, I would just say that, you know, I, I am not indigenous to this land, and I do not know a lot of things, and, and I do also feel myself to be dislocated from these contexts. And so I would really love to hear what Karudin and Nadira, you have to say. Mm. Um, and I feel like for me, um, actually researching the orchid has strangely helped me to start understanding like different ways of living on this land that is not the contemporary Singaporean way. Mm, you know, and, and, and learning how that was formed. So, so that's, that's my kind of thought on that as well. Um, and also thinking about, you know, how, how to engage Indigenous knowledges in an appropriate yeah. way that's ethical yeah. as well. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely something that uh, I wish we could have more conversations on as well. Absolutely. Kairudin, Nadira? Okay, I can go first. Yes, um, I feel that the simple acts of connecting with our elders when they cook, the practices they kept from their ancestors, from their forefathers, even their, grand their grandparents, these are some of the easiest ways that we can do in our everyday. It doesn't have to be, you know, big actions. It doesn't have to be grand gestures of, you know, going out in the streets or anything like that. You can do it in your home. 
Um, and also there are, I think there are more and more farm to table cuisines, so, you know, um, a lot of restaurants popping up with um, these ideas. And I think, you know, because of COVID also, there's an increasing trend towards nature trails, hikes, rediscovering our environment. And like you said, urban and community gardens by residents, people are more actively engaging with nature because they can't enter malls. So maybe, you know, nature is another substitute or alternative for that. Um, and what was interesting uh, and what came out of this was also, I think uh, in 2020, there were new animal species that were actually found um, in Pulau Ubin, for example. So, you know, uh, I think there is a greater push um, by the people themselves uh, to explore um, the, our nature and also engage more rather than um, just seeing our very manicured gardens and spaces. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kairudin? Yeah, uh, I, think, I think Narira brought up, uh, I think it was, uh, no, I think it was Chenning, brought up interesting uh, about the, the heritage trail. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, this, there's this, all these pockets of, uh, you know, little trails that they're starting to uh, build up. I think even in Badok, where I stay, there's this uh, area where they, they kind of put out, they put up this uh, sampan looking notice board. And uh, on it is a uh, really interesting uh, facts and history about the history of Bedok. So they, they even have like uh, images, archival images. And so there's all these, uh, you know, small pockets of heritage trails popping out. And I guess it's, it, they are trying to uh, make, you know, like uh, make people more aware of uh, the history of the place. And so... I think, yeah, one way to engage is to, you know, explore your neighborhood and, uh, you know, go to all these trails and experience, uh, you know, rather than being confined to just looking at uh, environmental history or nature through, you know, like uh, books or it's, it's about going out there and experiencing it and learning, you know, from the trails. So mm. that's, I think, a, a good way of, of doing it. Right, right. Yeah, and also pay attention to what the trails are emphasizing. Uh, what what mm. are the tra- what stories are the trails interested to you know bring out uh, and see what may be missing. You know, uh, the, I mean, and this goes to any any history you read. Uh, I mean, historians are just naturally skeptical. Okay, so anything that a historian reads is always like, hmm, okay, that's interesting. What's being emphasized? Or what's being paid attention to? So yeah. Um, so we get, you know, a kind of more meaningful picture of, of our past as well. Um, last uh, point of discussion before we move on to the Q&A, uh, and again, really kind of coming back to Singapore, the present. Um, but I mean, this could really apply anywhere, you know, is the survive. So it's, I'm really interested to ask you what, whether the survival of Singapore, as we understand it today, right, growth oriented, fully urban, except for some pockets, uh, and, and really hyper-modern, do you think this is compatible with meaningful commitment to climate justice or climate action? Um, we can go first. Nadira, do you want to go first? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I feel like this is a rather big question for me. Uh, so, personally, I think that climate justice is, you know, not just an environmental problem. It interacts with social systems, privileges, injustices, and it also affects people across different classes, race, gender, even generations unequally. So for a society like us and for a government like us, sustainability has to be at the heart of policy. Um, and I would not know how that can be done, but I feel that these things have to be taken into account, the things that I mentioned before, um, and not just Simply talking about you know using paper or gla- glass. I mean, sorry, metal straws over plastic straws. It's not that that is. We have to go beyond that if we want to talk about climate justice in a place like Singapore, and to work and collect with other, making other joint efforts with other developed nations. Um, I think that's also very important to make that commitment and also to follow through. It's also an important aspect. Right. Absolutely. Um. Sydney Karudin. Yep. Yes, uh, so I think, I think Singapore has made, uh, you know, a lot of uh, commitments uh, 
through I believe they have uh, recently created the like a a plan for a low carbon future. Mm. So there's this all this I I saw the you know like the policy and there's all these kind of transformations that they envision in all these different industries. So like uh, economy or even society. So I think S- Singapore is committed to green growth and sustainability. Mm. Uh, at least that's what is being uh, you know talked about. And uh, I think in the context of, you know, you mentioned like uh, Singapore is a growth oriented, fully urban and hyper modern, uh, you know, city. And it's, uh, I think the Singapore is trying to it kind of do its best to balance between having, you know, this kind of ultra modern and growth oriented with uh, mitigating these effects, you know, by enacting all this, uh, you know, low carbon, uh, goals and mm, mm, mm. but i guess and in in the in the kind of grand scheme of things it's i mean like global warming and it's it's a it's a it's a global issue and as as a country we we can do our part but you know we we can't really if if the kind of bigger uh, countries out there they, they don't really do it it's right. i think You've eventually their weight yeah 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 eventually we can do so much but right, if, right. if it happens it happens Right, and it, so it's really it's really about a global kind of paradigm shift, yeah. almost right. I mean, what what is considered, uh, um, you know, a meaningful social pursuit. I mean, is growth at all costs really something that we should be aiming for? Uh, things like that, and you know, I mean, to be fair, yes, there are sort of all these international summits are putting together targets, uh, etc. Sending any thoughts? Yeah, one one hundred percent. I mean, <laughs> Singapore's Singapore's uh, economy is completely it succeeds only because it's like part of this global economy, right? That exactly, is yeah. that is so um, that is very reliant on fossil fuels. That is, you know, um, just not green at all. Mm-hmm. So yeah, for sure, I think it's a it's a global paradigm shift and. Um, I mean, I think it was like Raja Ratnam had said, you know, if like the global con, like if the global economy collapses, then we will collapse. But you know, that that is unlikely to happen, or something, because that is like that would be like the end of human civilization. But I I do right. feel like there is a point there of like Singapore being tagged to that, and and, and the question for me is like what role can we as like a small nation play in this mm. very global story as well? Um, and with, with regards to, you know, I, I guess the green initiatives, I think there are a lot of things like green building initiatives, for example, that might look green, but yeah. maybe are not super green. In, right. in a way that exactly. they're like tearing down old buildings that are still functional. Exactly. Yeah, to build yeah. new green buildings, right? And that's, I think, it's important to, as citizens, to like look beyond the words as well mm. and see, you know, actually what is happening on the level right. of infrastructure. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. And I think I was kind of asking this question because I'm really, because because it seems to me on the surface that there's a lot of greenwashing happening, exactly like what you said, you know, green building um blah, 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 uh, eco-friendly. I mean, these are the KPIs, right? Um, but at heart, I think I'm a little bit more pessimistic. I think that if, if you know, climate justice is going to happen, you really, I mean, we can't continue to prioritize, you know, growth and, and urbanization at all costs and then do these minor gestures like, you know, build more sustainable buildings or built seawalls and climate resilient structures and things like that. I think, you know, it's really about prioritizing different things, you know, maybe we don't really need to, you know, build another fossil fuel plant or, or, or something like that. So, you know, it's really, yeah, that's uh, kind of the, 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 the paradigm uh, shift that needs to happen, I feel. Anyway, we are at 11.30, so I think uh, we're good to go into Q&A. Uh, let's open the Slido and see who has questions. Um, I will go with 
some of the early the uh, the first question is by Alfian Saad, <laughs> early bird catches the worm. Um, this is directed at Zuning. Um, I like the Human X Nature exhibition too, but I was wondering what you thought of the final segment. I was excited by the more critical elements in the earlier parts about colonial extraction, environmental destruction, and neglect of indigenous knowledge. But the ending was a bit falsely triumphant, right? Victories in Chek Jawa and Sungai Bulu, but not the losses like Bukit Brown, Cross Island Line, Central Catchment, etc. And smacked a little of state greenwashing. What's your response? Um, and anyone else can can jump in if you have uh, thoughts yeah. on this as well. Yeah, uh a hundred percent. I think also there was like, in the later segment, there was like one panel on land reclamation. And I was just like, you cannot have just one panel on land reclamation when a quarter of our country is like reclaimed land, right? And and I totally agree. And I also think that it's also exciting in a way because I, I am, you know, doing research on land reclamation. And I do feel like this is a place and this is a space where I want to be writing about and um, I want to be thinking more critically about and mm. uh, a place where I feel like there's still so much to do for so many people and, and not just mm. curators, and not just the librarians, but yeah. also like, I guess people like me, I'm a writer, I, I don't do much. I, I don't I don't feel like I do much in terms of like the writing of history, like like curators, you know, but um I just I just find that I think I left it thinking, you know, there's still so much to write about. And this is like my motivation to write, I mm. think. Um the the other thing is I think, you know, the the victories in like yeah. Chijawa and Sungai Bolo. Um, I think some things that, for example, my friend who also went to that exhibition talked about was like, oh, like he never really knew all of this stuff. And, and, I, and he, was, he was very kind of um, amazed by the kind of change that has been brought about by participatory like politics in that sense. And I mm. think that is kind of, interesting as well you know the takeaway if the takeaway is that maybe it's also an emphasis on citizen participation and mm. activism um mm. so that is one positive spin but of course i agree with you that so much more like the really meaty stuff is just beginning um yeah. in the later segment and, and that's frustrating, right? Because because with like the reclamation thing, it's always kind of explained the way as as an as an evil necessity, but a necessity no less, right? And so everything else has to bend at the knee because we have to expand, you know. And like, do we really? I mean, like, why is this really the binary? I mean, surely we can find more creative solutions for our whatever our land needs that don't have to be so destructive. I mean, that's just me, but. I agree, um, and and yes, with the activism stuff, it it also felt to me as a a, a a comment on the right way to to do activism that was collaborative and consultative, and you know don't get too hasty with your demands and things like that. Go about it slowly, and you know, surely enough, you know, the state will will grant your your petition. I mean, so there's a lot going on there. I agree. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, please. Yeah, Sorry, I just wanted to, to <laughs> yeah. add that too. Yeah. I, I think there, there are some very interesting tactics by like Singaporean, I guess, like nature con like conservationists. Like mm. for example, in the Limau estate, uh, there's like one small hill here and, and they wanted to like cut and parcel out the um, parts of the hill that have just forest fragments. Mm. And I think what activists did was um, they tried to like find heritage trees, like trees that would qualify as heritage trees mm. on the hill and then tried to submit it to, I think, uh, and parks. I'm not really sure. Um, because if it was a like a heritage tree, then they wouldn't be able to kind of cut the hill and take all the trees down with it. Right, right. But I mean, it, it was objected, like uh, it didn't go through, but... Mm. Um, yeah, I think there are so many of these 
stories for sure that um, are not being highlighted um, and tactics that are not being highlighted uh, right. in the in the exhibition. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you. Um, let's see. Okay, like, I'm I'm trying to go chronologically. Um, Nat has a question: How do we encourage the dislocated slash alienated majority to care more about indigenous ways of life? Um, there's a lot going on there. Um, anyone have any thoughts? Well, my take is actually the. I mean, there isn't. Historically, there wasn't so much of such a stuck divide between what we consider an alienated majority and, and, and a more connected indigenous community. Because actually, if you look at it, there were also many so-called emigre communities who uh, had adopted indigenous patterns of life, right? So again, if you read Cynthia Cho, you learn about Teochew fishermen who adopted Malay fishing methods. They consulted Malay pawangs, right? They worshipped Malay deities at sea to make sure they were safe, right, to ensure a good catch. So it's also about recognizing that the emigre communities of Singapore had at one point in time adopted many of these different more kind of uh, uh, indigenous uh, modes of knowledge that engage with the environment, um, you know, in that kind of uh, yeah, in a, in 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 a, in, a, in a very contextual way, in a way that they understood uh, these ecologies uh, inherited from indigenous communities. So, I wouldn't be so hasty to draw that divide so cleanly. Um, and so, in the present, surely it's about really recognizing that the non-indigenous or emigre communities were also, in many ways, historically, had participated in in many of these, you know, embedded. Uh, ways of understanding the environment. Uh, that's my take. Uh, yeah. Okay. Should we move on to the next question? Are we good? Okay. Um, Ashwari asks if there are any conceptual frameworks or words in environmental history here that hold all the complex meanings of the environment or that are used to interrogate it. Hmm. Conceptual frameworks, so in local environmental history, I'm assuming is 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 being asked here that whole conceptual meanings. Any Nadira, I feel like you'd probably be be, be well suited to to tackle this frameworks words. I mean, yeah, if you're looking at kind of like local environmental knowledge, I'm sure there's quite a rich corpus there. Um, any that may be potentially useful or insightful. Yeah, unfortunately, I cannot offer my expertise yeah. on this because, yeah, right. not, yeah, sure, sorry. Oops, yeah, sorry, I had a technical issue there. <laughs> Everyone can still hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I, yeah. Kairudin, any thoughts to that? Uh, Frameworks or Tsuning, if you, if you want to jump in. Frameworks for, I think, Sorry, can you? Can you... <laughs> can you kind of uh, rephrase that question again? Yep, sorry. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> oh, hmm. I, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really. <laughs> I mean, I, I wish. <laughs> That I, I could offer something of substance. It's I think it's quite difficult to to hold everything into a word or mm. framework when we are talking about something like, you know, environmental history is so uh, it's connected to so many different things or it encompasses so, quite quite different things. So yeah, it's a bit Absolutely. Yeah. Hard to boil it down to a, a word. Words. Yeah, hold on. I'm trying to get my Slido back up. I, I had a whole issue. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not completely sure as well, but I think some words that have held a lot of mythological power over, like contemporary Singapore, might be like, um, 
for for sure garden garden city and now nature as well um and then in the past like it was a lot about swamps and how mm. swamps were like kind of uh like mosquito infested and like yeah backward you know and i i think that all of these uh, words have their specific cultural meanings. For sure, mm. now that it's like city in nature, that's a conceptual framework that we can interrogate. You know, what is nature in here? Oh, also the word biophilic, I think is another mm. very interesting word to interrogate and ask, what do we mean by that? And what are we doing to achieve that? And do we agree with it? Um, so maybe not like, hold all the complex meanings, but maybe words that we can use to like uh, as a starting point into research. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I think right. you mentioned like garden. I think that's a very strong word that's always been uh, recurrent in our sort of uh, imagination as, yeah. as city dwellings, Singaporeans in a garden city because uh, you know, the, the word garden itself is so loaded with uh, kind of colonial implications, like yeah. mm -hmm. the English garden and all that. So the, yeah. the desire to construct, a, you know, a desired landscape around you is, is so rooted mm -hmm. in that colonial, you know, framework. So right. And it's yeah. a specific gardening philosophy, yes. right? Because of yeah. course, the, there, are differing, there are different gardening cultures in, in, yeah. in different parts of the world, but but the one that we understand in Singapore really is really that kind of European botanical garden yeah. that actually had very commercial um, impetuses or mm. rather objectives, mm -hmm. right? It was really about experimenting with cash crops and things like that. Yeah, um, and also yeah. like the global garden city movement as well. Mm. I think it's mm. very interesting to see how every country has all these completely different garden cities you know that might be yeah. a way to kind of understand the very specific um mm. ideas of nature we have through our yeah. iteration of the garden city yeah so i think the garden really kind of captures that tension in many ways because what it's promising is this kind of idyllic vision of nature and and being able to exist in harmony with it but what it's built on really is this kind of uh uh, imperial logic of classifying and arranging things very neatly. Um, even the so-called English garden, which borrows landscape, right? Very different from the French formal garden, but but still, I mean, um, what its objectives are aligned with uh, really still imperial science uh, and, and the, the plantation economy quite tied to that. Um, okay, uh, Madhumita has a question about the personal and family farm histories. With the current 30 by 30 plan, the state's logic for food cell sufficiency is through high-tech and intensive farming methods. What is the place of the histories of family farms in our changing food system, where we are bringing back notions of cell sufficiency without the relationship with nature? Very good question. Um, who brought up the family farms just now? Uh, <laughs> Nadira, yeah. right? Yeah. That was me. Um, what is the place of the histories of family farms in our changing food system? Um, yeah, I think that there are a lot of efforts, like for example, if you go to NTC now, you can find kale and so on and so forth. And then it says that it's manufactured by a certain lab in Singapore or something like that. So there are all of these, um, you know, um, methods that we have incorporated um, that allows for more self-sufficiency but yeah that's a good point that there is no relationship with nature because you know they're all in, done um, in labs and um, there is no like you're not experiencing it um, sort of under the hot sun with you know with mm. yeah with, with, with that kind of living environment which I actually mentioned was what was actually fascinating to me you know being being in touch with nature in a sense that it was such an experiential um, uh, experience, for lack of a better word. So the place of histories of family farms is, you know, it's it's basically even is it it's like right now just a footnote in our history. And I really hope that there can be more conversations about this that we can bring up. And yeah, that's yeah. Nice. 
Yeah, it's really interesting um, because like, you know, with this 30 by 30 thing and the high tech farming, um, it is another level, a kind of dislocation too, right? Because you're still not kind of in dealing, you don't have to deal so much with, you know, weather and, and the natural conditions and things like that. Because again, in many ways, it's everything so controlled. It's a controlled environment as well. Um, less labor intensive and all that, sure. But in some ways, it's still a removal um, and there's a lot to be dealt with there. Um, let's see, any questions? Um, City New Garden. Well, there's another question here about um, support for, supporting justice for indigenous people in Singapore. Apologies if this has been covered, came late. Yeah, like I said, you know, the indigenous is a very complicated category in Singapore and, and in many ways um, other sort of communities not conventionally thought of as indigenous had also kind of adopted many many of these um, indigenous patterns of life. Uh, there were actually in when I was reading 19th century Malay travelogues realized that there were many Malay elites who had become urbanites uh, and you know kind of really seduced by the comforts of European gaslighting and, and things like that and, and couldn't stand walking through forests and drinking from streams. Uh, so, you know, they were, you know, one category of indigenous community, definitely different from people out, Malays out in the southern islands whose ways of life were very much in touch with the environment well until the 1980s. So, you know, indigenous here is, is really quite broad and varied category. Uh, and their relationship to the environment is also, you know, um, quite varied. Um, yeah, but but thank you for the question anyway. Um, let's see, there are other questions here. Hmm. Um, there was someone, okay, uh, are there Malay words? So we looked at garden. Uh, are there Malay words that explain uh, you know, tensions or meanings in environmental history. Um, any come to mind, Kairudin, Nadira? Hmm. I'm thinking, well, civilizationally, in that sense, if you're looking at um, Malay texts um, from before the colonial period, there was uh, a kind of distinction, I suppose, between you know, the world of a forest where there's a lot of mambang and, you know, spirits uh, and sprites and, 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 and mythical creatures and the world of the Nagri. So that's the settled kind of port city community that was civilized and that's where humans dwelt and it was a space of culture. There was a space of culture as distinct from space of the natural and the supernatural also, right? Um, but of course, in the context of that pre-industrial time, uh, that distinction was hard to materialize in reality uh, the way we saw it much later in, in the modern period. So I suppose that's one Malay conception of the natural as opposed to the human uh, that we saw. Um, yeah, but again, that was an ideal in, in literature. Um, if you read a lot of oral literature, you notice that actually Malays were drawing upon um, natural imagery in very routine ways because they understood it so much and they became metaphors for, you know, human emotions and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of material out there to read about pantuns, etc., uh, especially. Kairudin, hey, yes. Yeah, so I, no, I, I feel like this is a uh, question best suited for uh, shout out to Alfian who... <laughs> shout out to Alfian! <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Who is doing, I think, a lot of research on uh, Malay, you know, words and... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and kind of like the botanic in, in, yes. in, Malay, in Malay aesthetics. The vegetal... Malay literature. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I don't think there are any new questions. Did you all have anything to that you wanted to bring up that we didn't have time for earlier? Any thoughts? Um, yeah. Hmm. Mm, I think Kairo didn't actually mention uh, Juraimi Samsuri, the yes. collector. Yeah, I was just, it, I just um, remembered that during World War II, during the Japanese occupation, 
his um, drawings were actually um, used by the Japanese to create wood block, wood block prints to study the nature in, in, um, in, in Singapore. So, you know, like it's, it's, it's just something that popped up into my head when I think part of his name. Mm. Just a little trivia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, see everyone one... should, yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say everyone should go check out that permanent exhibition at the yeah. Botanical Museum, uh, the Botanical Gardens Gallery or something, because all of a lot of Jurani's drawings are on display and he's credited. Yeah. Yeah, but sorry, Kairudin, please. No, uh, I was just seeing that there's a uh, one question that uh, uh, oh. it's about the word forest and what are the yes. conversations. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was wondering I, I was wondering if we covered that through garden. But yeah, do you have any thoughts perhaps? Uh um, yeah, I think for mm, forest is uh it's kind of I'm not sure, will you say like a like the jungle, like uh, you know, like this jungle, is it like a forest? I Isn't think in this... Singapore, yeah, I feel like in Singapore, it's really more the mangrove. The mangrove mm. has that connotation of the wild thing that needs to be tamed and and, and cleared. Because um, we talk about Jurong a lot when we talk about a lot of, you know, reclamation projects and industrial Singapore. It's always the, the mangrove, right? Or the swamp, right? That needs to be, to be kind of, it becomes a symbol for the natural obstacle that needs to be cleared for. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, when I think of forest, I think about the different kind of cultural uh, connections to like forest. Like I think one of them, I guess for me, the one of the more like uh, uh, prominent ones is like the German connection to like the forest, the Schwarzwald. Mm. And like it's, it's for them, it's like a kind of, uh, you know, there's a sense of, you know, uh, adventure or longing or even sadness. And so there's all this kind of, uh, you know, palimpsest of... Uh, uh, meanings and histories and yes. I think different cultures uh, connect with their forest or rainforest or jungles in very different ways and I guess for Southeast Asia it's like uh, I mean like for I think the Malay word is like hutan you know hutan rimba it's mm -hmm. like jungle and I think the, the connotation with that is is it's always kind of a, a, a realm where there's also you know like a, a supernatural like like your parents would say oh don't don't go venture out into like the hutan and mm -hmm. you don't know yeah so yeah absolutely and and to the malays it seems if if you read um the older literature at least it seems that the forest was a much more threatening environment compared to the sea the sea was an open kind of like environment that they were more or less more comfortable with even though yes there were potent spiritual entities that you had to look out for uh, but more or less the sea was always kind of uh, it represented mobility it represented connection right uh, the forest was a kind of impenetrable domain almost um, yeah sorry I would, Nadira, would... Yeah, sorry no no yeah. I... <laughs> I would also like to add um, like in Malay itself uh, hutan you know there are different um, categories to hutan there's hutan yes. belantara uh, there's hutan rimba, which is, um, so belantara is basically um, similar to rimba, um, just very lush. And then you have uh, hutan beluka, which yes. is, um, you know, um, a forested area where there's a lot of small like um, branches and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then even uh, hutan, um, what is it called? Perawan or hutan asli. Uh, hutan perawan and hutan asli are basically forests that have never been touched. You know, there's no deforestation that ever occurred there. So I think that fact that there are so many uh, names for Bhutan itself in the Malay in, in, in Malay um, says a lot about how much we kind of um, are, or how much we used to interact uh, yes. and live amongst the forests and you know the kind of reverence that we have for the for the forest, not just for sustenance for food. But also the fact that we just we hold a lot of respect towards it as a natural living environment that we coexist with. So I think that in itself, you know, the idea of naming Hutan is a really interesting and fascinating. Absolutely, absolutely. The very, very again, very systematic uh, knowledge that that was possessed about uh, uh, the space like the forest um, showed that there was a, a lot of interaction with it, understanding of it, um, and that fear or what should we say that regard for the dangers of the forest um, 
was also quite instrumental in 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 you know it's very different from this attitude of exploiting and and wanting to clear and overcome the wilderness so that's also another another aspect of of that cultural relationship to the environment as well um yeah well it's um we've come to the end of today's panel um thank you very much Zuning, uh, Kayudin and Nadira uh for sharing your really really insightful thoughts um coming from your you know um work and research as well uh, I certainly learned quite a lot today um and thank you to our audience as well I'm going to hand time back to uh Weilin uh please Thank you so much to all our speakers for this really insightful conversation. I think you've covered so much in the past hour and a half. <laughs> and also to our viewers who have asked uh, really good questions as well. So we hope that this panel has given you a little bit of uh, food for thought um, for the stories we tell ourselves about our natural heritage. The captioned recording for this talk, uh, as well as the full transcript, will be available on the Ethos website in good time. Uh, I saw that you know there were a few uh, requests on... Uh, the chat to uh, for a list of references that our speakers have so usefully provided uh, during the talk and so we will consolidate the list and we'll provide that um, uh, with the transcript as well. So to support our work and learn more about um, Singapore's history and alternative narratives, please check out our titles, Raffles Renounced, which is a collection of essays that approaches Singapore's history from a revisionist standpoint, as well as the Orchid Folios, which is a collection of experimental poetry that also serves as a documentary novella. So we will place the link to these publications and more in the chat. Uh, I realized there were also quite a few uh, questions about the forest. And interestingly, we actually had another panel uh, last Saturday uh, called Treasures from Our Forest that would be interesting to some of you uh, in the audience here. So I'll place the link uh, in the chat as well. So uh, have a very good Saturday, everybody. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.